Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Would you stand with me? We want to pray together. It's good to be together in the house of the Lord tonight to bring praise to him and to hear what the Lord would have for us. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace tonight. We're so thankful of your presence among us and that we can gather together again in this place. What a gift you've given us. And so, God, we fully receive it tonight. Whatever you'd want to do or to say, we, uh, we receive it tonight. Lord, may you be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Sunday evening. Take this time to greet one another.
is good to be together. And if you're still standing, you're out of the game. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it always happens to me, too. I'm always standing and the music stops. So it's okay. Only, only in like musical chairs do you have to worry about things like that. So we're okay. Well, just a couple announcements. One, there are letters. Everybody say letters. letters. There are some leftover letter mail from Christmas uh, with your name on it. Maybe with your name on it. But you need to go check. We all need to check. And if you don't collect it tonight, uh, what did Pastor Shore say? They're going to be burnt in effigy. So we're sticking to that, I think. Um, so check it out. And if you see somebody else's like mail and you know them and you're good friends with them, you could just pick it up for them and then deliver it to them or something like that. You could be the mail person this week. That'd be fun. Okay, so enough of that. Also, if you would like to host a home on February 1st, coming up the first day of February, Yep, that's it, February 1st. Uh, there will be home fellowship groups, and so we need folks to host homes. If you would just be willing to open up your home to, for a 2 or 8 or 36 or 50 or 100, just post that and let the office know. We would love to have uh, some more host homes. They're just a wonderful time. Home fellowship groups are a wonderful time for us to kind of grow in community together and maybe get to know some people that you don't know very well in a home setting. So sign up for that if you'd be willing to host a home coming up February 1st. If our ushers would come, let's pray for the offering tonight. Here they come. Troy smiling and everything. Wonderful. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your love and your goodness and all that you've given us, God. We are a blessed people. And so, God, we give you our tithes and our offerings, and we ask you to use it for your good and your glory and to the building up of your kingdom. We offer it to you tonight out of gratitude and out of a worshipful heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In these last two songs, I just want to invite you to enter, enter worship however you feel most comfortable. I love it. Um, in, the more, in, the, in the beginning part of this evening we had during our rehearsal, Tom and Jana's little girls were just worshiping and dancing and just, oh, I just loved it. It just filled my heart with joy. And I see you guys over here bebopping with the drums, and I just love that. I love that. You don't have to just stand, but you can just stand and worship the Lord and just be still in his presence. But we just want you to know that you have permission to do that, however you feel comfortable. Amen. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love. i mm -hmm. 
neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 38 and 39. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your care for when I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. You are breaking new ground. So make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing. All you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Because where there is new wine, there is new To carry your new fire to new day. Where there is new wine, there is new power, there is new freedom. And the kingdom is here. I lay down my old flames to carry your new. Make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus.
Jesus, bring your wine out of me. Jesus, bring your wine out of me. Jesus, bring your wine out of me. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine in the soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground you are breaking new ground stand as we go to prayer. Let's take a few moments and just pray. Some of us may have come with some burdens. Maybe there's some things you're facing this week. And uh, the good thing for us to remember is God hears your prayer. And God wants to hear us as we pray. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your justice in your goodness. We thank you for this work, God, of making us a vessel, making us an offering. And God, we thank you for leading the way through Jesus. You poured yourself out as an offering for the world. And by your Holy Spirit, Lord, we can do the same. We can lay down our lives and pour out ourselves so that others may know of the love of Christ. Thank you, God, making us a vessel. So I pray that you would fill us up, fill us up with yourself. Overwhelm us with your presence tonight, Lord, in new and fresh ways. Surprise us by your hope and your grace tonight. Lord, we lay down the weight of the things that so easily fill our minds. We give them to you. We lay them at your feet. Lots of things that we're thinking about or concerns or worries or fears. And so we gladly lay them at your feet tonight, Lord. Because most importantly, like, like Mary did before you, you died on the cross, just sat and positioned herself in front of you to hear from you. So God, that is our posture tonight. We want to sit and hear from you tonight. Thank you for Pastor Kathy and being attentive to the word that you've given her for us tonight. So Lord, with our mouths and with our minds and our thoughts. Lord, we honor you tonight. Thank you for Pastor Kathy and her ministry among us and to us tonight through your word. I pray that you would use and speak through her your words to us. We open ourselves to receive what you would have for us today and this evening. We give you praise in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Well, good evening. My hope is that the words and the spirit of that song is the song of your heart and the song of your life. I thought it was a perfect way for us to commemorate Epiphany, which is the season that we're in. So welcome on this first Sunday evening of Epiphany. Uh, and since we're in the Epiphany season, I thought we would focus on that tonight. Um, many of you are familiar with what Epiphany is, but I want to just take a few minutes just to reflect on it. One, so that it's fresh in our minds, and two, it might help any who aren't fluent in the meaning of the Epiphany season and exactly what it means to the universal church. So let's just dive right in, and we'll start with the Oxford. Um, Oxford defines the Epiphany as the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles as represented by the Magi in Matthew 2, verses one through 12, which is our main text tonight. 
Um, this definition aligns with the Greek word from where epiphany is derived. The Greek word is epiphania, which means appearing or revealing. Epiphany is also known as Three Kings Day or the Feast of the Epiphany. Many Eastern Christians call it theophany instead of epiphany. And theophany means the manifestation of God. The word epiphany is also used to describe a, a, a perception of the essential nature or meaning of something. It's also a word that we use to describe an intuitive grasp of reality through something such as an event or an occurrence of some kind. And then another description for the word um, we use is to describe something like an illuminating discovery or realization. The Feast of the Epiphany is a common celebration of the season in many nations, not just our nation uh, and Western nations. Um, and it's also celebrated in many Christian traditions. It commemorates the revelation of God incarnate in Jesus. In Western Christianity, the feast commemorates the vis visit of the Magi to the Christ child and thus Jesus's physical manifestations to the Gentiles. Now, as Christians, our calendar is focused around seasons of the one who gives us life and who we have fully surrendered our lives to. He's the only one who has affected the world so much that the world calendar is actually ordered by him. We have a seven day week cycle because of God's creation week. There's no logical reason apart from creation week to have a seven day week cycle, especially considering that we have the yearly cycle of seasons and the monthly cycles because of the sun and moon. So if the theory of evolution is correct, then every nationality would, by the law of averages, they would have come up with different cycles. So some would have five day weeks and others might have 10 and so on. However, since the time of creation, we have the seven day week model, which was established by God and accepted by the world. We are also in the year of our Lord 2020, and the world accepts Jesus as the mark of time, BC and AD. Hmm, it just kind of makes a person wonder when the whole world accepts this, and yet there's so much skepticism and there's so many scoffers. These are very basic things that all have come to accept as truth. How then is it possible for them to deny Christ when these very basic things are absolutely rooted in the God of the Holy Bible beginning at creation and continuing today through the epiphany? That's another mystery to me. I have um, some suspicions as to why scoffers uh, accept Christ according to the Gregorian calendar, but not Jesus. Jesus is the, is the one that the world uses as a guide to mark time, even if non-believers refer to the time before Christ as BCE. I know you guys remember when there was a change in that and some non-Christians, they wanted to change that to, the, to stand for be, before common era. But it doesn't change the fact that our years are marked from the point of Christ himself. They can call it whatever they want, but Jesus is the, the demarcation line. So we have BC, which we recognize, and it was recognized and honored by uh, everyone for years as the before Christ era, and then the AD era, which is Anno Domini, which means it's the Latin for our Lord. And if that doesn't speak to the magnitude effect that Christ has on all things, even worldly things, then I don't know what else does. Um, so getting back to the church calendar, the four Sundays prior to Christmas are a part of the Advent season. And this is the time that we commemorate the silent years before the Messiah was born and the time that he will return again. And then we celebrate Christmas beginning on Christmas uh, Day, which is December 25th. And we begin the 12 days of Christmas. 
The 13th day after Christmas, which is January 5th, is the Epiphany, which is where we will be until Transfiguration Sunday, followed by the Lent season. And that brings us up into Easter. So I think that's a good introduction into our text tonight and the season of Epiphany that it inspires. So we're going to open up our Bibles to Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12, and ask the Lord to translate that to our hearts and minds and our spirits and souls. So let's pray before we get into the reading of the word, shall we? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your written and spoken word. We thank you, God, for uh, the power that it brings, the truth and illumination that it brings to us. Lord, we ask that you would use your word and penetrate us deeply with it. Let it become part of us and shape us, Lord, in your ways and in the kingdom. For the kingdom's glory, Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. The word of the Lord, Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The significance of the Magi is more than we could ever really cover tonight and fully understand. However, there's much that we can't understand and is at the root of our identity and our hope and salvation. It's also the reason for the epiphany season in the church. I want to ask you a question, and you can answer out loud, or it can be a rhetorical question to you, whatever you want to do, however you want to work it. It's totally fine with me. I just have this question. Who were the first Gentiles to encounter Christ? Anybody want to shout out or feel comfortable doing that? The first Gentiles. Good guess. Good guess. It was the Magi, which we go, oh, that's interesting. These very important people, how could they be Gentiles? But that is in fact the truth, that the Magi are the first Gentiles to encounter Jesus. We think about the shepherds in the field who are considered the lowest of low. I mean, if you were anything, you did not want to be a shepherd because they were considered just lower than slaves. And so we know that they, though, those shepherds, they were Jews. They were Jewish people. The family of Jesus were Jewish. And everyone else who encountered Jesus up to this point was Jewish. I don't know if there's anybody here that's Jewish. Is anybody here Jewish? I'm not Jewish. So then everyone here is a Gentile. 
So those are non-Jewish folk. We are non-Jewish folk, which makes us Gentiles. So these Magi were Gentiles, and they traveled many miles to see the prophesied Christ and sought him with determination. And a few weeks ago, if you were here listening to Pastor Joe when he preached, he really expounded on the details of this event. And based on the expounding information we have in Scripture itself, we can safely surmise that these Gentile men, they sought Jesus with everything they had. What was their response to the Christ child? These non-Jewish people. If we look at our text in verse 11, we see that these magi, these Gentiles, they bowed down, they worshiped him, they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts. And what were these gifts? Gold, which was the only present fit for a king in that day and age. And then we had frankincense, which is an oil that denotes spiritual good. And it was used in temples for priests during grain offerings. So not for sin offerings, because frankincense represents righteousness. Frankincense comes from the Baswella tree, and it's a quite rare tree. And at that point, it was possibly quite more in value than the gold that they presented. And the last gift they brought was myrrh, which is an oil used for purification and embalming purposes. Now we know now that these gifts were presented to God because it represented who he was. They presented these gifts to Jesus, recognizing that he was in fact the Christ. He was the Messiah. The gold representing his kingship as king of the Jews. The frankincense because he is the priest for the people who presents a sinless offering unto God. And this affirms Jesus as righteous and holy to serve in this priestly role because only priests would have the ability to use frankincense, and myrrh representing the future death of Christ. So the presentation of these gifts tell that these three powerful non-Jewish men humbled themselves before Christ, and two, they recognized Jesus as the Christ child and bowed down before him. This passage helps us understand that Christ came for all men. Not just the Jews or elite, but through Jesus, God reveals himself to all, including us. And he invites us to bow down and worship him just like the Magi did. We are invited to allow him to be our king, our priest, and the sacrifice for our sins. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we can die and live in his power as new creations. And as new creations in Christ, we have the power to refuse sin and become a holy, righteous people. His people set apart for his kingdom and purpose. Now, some Christians, um, some Christian traditions, they celebrate Epiphany by commemorating another revelation event uh, that's in the Bible. And it's a huge event. It was actually mentioned in the servant service this morning by Pastor Dave. I'm wondering if anybody here feels brave enough to go, I, is, it, is it this event? Does anybody know what some other Christian traditions commemorate Epiphany with? So if not the Magi visit, which is the revelation of who Jesus is and the Christ, there is another revelation of Jesus. And that was at Jesus' baptism at the Jordan River. So if you remember correctly, Jesus is baptized. So he goes to the Jordan River, John baptizes him, and the vo the, a voice of heaven can be heard, and it's the Father, and the descending Holy Spirit comes in the form of a dove, descends on the, the head of Jesus during, this, during his baptism, and the voice says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. So another revelation. So those two events are celebrated during the season of Epiphany, depending on which Christian tradition um, you, you uh, practice in. 
Now listen to the word found in 2 Timothy 1.10, which sums up this epiphany and the ministry of Jesus, which Paul established that began before the beginning of time and is finally revealed to us in Jesus Christ. So 2 Timothy 1.10, this is the word of the Lord. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this scripture, it sums up the epiphany season well. Jesus is God. His he is the word incarnate. He is the reason for this whole season, and he is the reason we have cause to celebrate. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. God saves us and calls us to live a holy life, and he did this because it was his plan from before time began, not because we deserved it, not because we did anything to earn that gift from him. He wants to show us his grace through Jesus Christ. And I was just sharing with someone the other day, love and grace, they work in tandem. They work together. And God was showing that he loves us. He, he meets us where we are. That's an unconditional love. And he offers us grace. And that comes through Christ. The only way it can be delivered and administered to us. So we must turn our eyes to Christ, to the Christ, and without him, we are lost. Our human nature, which is rooted in sin since the fall of man in the garden, prevents us from seeing things as they truly are. So we need the guiding light of our Savior to reveal himself to us. He guides us in truth. Only Jesus can have us see things the way they really are. So his manifestation to us as celebrated in Epiphany is the gospel. He is the good news. And as we celebrate the Epiphany of Christ our Lord, we recognize that he reveals himself to us personally, N not just corporately, but personally. So it's a both and. He came for all, not just the Magi, but the shepherds, the tax collectors, the stable hands, the carpenters, the mothers, the fathers, the kings of the world, he came for you and he came for me. And everyone must respond to Christ. Even no response is a response. We know how the Magi responded, but what about the shepherds in the fields? What was their response? You may recall that they ran to Jesus when they heard the news. And what about the king? King Herod, what was his response? Anger, hate, fear. What was he so angry about? Where was all this hate and rage coming from? You have an idea, Garrett? That is excellent. That is excellent. I love the way you just kind of summed that up very simply. I think that we can relate to him. If we've ever wanted to be in control and have the power of control of our own life and those around us, maybe we won't tolerate other people imposing their ways and their will on us. And if it's not for the sake of righteousness, it's just for us wanting to do things our way, I think we can identify with King Herod. It's amazing to be able to identify on any level with a, a king who slaughtered all the baby boys under the age of two because he feared losing control. He feared his power would be undermined and people would not think of him as the king. He didn't want anyone usurping his throne. He wanted to be the king. He wanted to rule. 
Have you ever wanted to be someone's number one or imposed your power and will over someone else, even knowing that they weren't comfortable doing it? We like to look at others and think, oh, what a terrible person they are. And, and maybe they are. In this case, I think ter- t- King Herod is terrible. That's a good description of him. But when we stop to think what's driving his behavior, I think we can identify with him on some level. And maybe identify with others who respond to Jesus in the same way with anger, with fear and hate. How dare someone come in and change things up? I have established my king. I like the way my life is going. What about the angels? They sang and proclaimed Jesus' glory. And what about the mother of Jesus herself, Mary. She didn't understand it at all, but she welcomed Jesus. She risked her marriage and her reputation to trust God's plan, even though it was more painful than I can even imagine at times. And she loved him the whole time. With all of her being, she loved him. And we can see that love in her obedience and full surrender to his plan and his will. Tonight, I just want us to ask ourselves in this epiphany season, how have we and how are we responding to Christ? Have we bowed down in every way Do we assume a posture of submission to our Savior? Do we worship the one true King and the only one who can save us from ourselves? Do we present treasures to him? Remembering what Jesus said about treasures. They are things that cannot be ruined and cannot be stolen. But these are the things that can be found in heaven. So anything that you or I offer to him outside of that is of no value to him. He wants our love, he wants our trust, and he wants our obedience. He wants to make our lives righteous and holy and good. Isn't it crazy how we don't surrender to God when we know that for one, we're sinful in nature and therefore bent on our own destruction. So left to our own devices, we will damn our own selves. And we know that about ourselves. And we know that we cannot even compare to the wisdom of God. Is there anybody here that thinks that they know more than God? I think all of us would go, I can't even Come close to that. My best, smartest day is foolishness to God, right? But yet, we would still impose our own way. And sometimes on other people as well. Even causing them to sin with us. We really do need the guiding light of the Holy Spirit. Without him, we cannot recognize truth. Knowing everything we know about ourselves and how we fall short in every way, we need him. Otherwise, we will walk down that, we'll drive like a freight train down the wrong path without the Holy Spirit saying, whoa, whoa. When we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit and we bow down before Christ as sinners and we die with him and are born again, we live in worship of him. His Holy Spirit moves into our hearts and begins to reign supreme over our days. You know, just because we deny something doesn't change the reality of something. It just changes our understanding of it. 
We can create our own reality, but if it's false, it's false. If I want to believe that I'm a Jew, so when, we, when I asked for any, any you know, Jewish people, Jewish heritage people to raise their hand, I could have said, oh, that's me. And I could really create a false reality in my mind and believe that I am Jew. I am a Jew. I could say and I could tell everybody and I could start living that way and practicing that way, but it doesn't change reality. Many of you have heard the name uh, Rachel Dolezal, who is a former chapter president of the NAACP, which is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Is anybody familiar with the story? She identifies as a black woman. Um, but she's a white girl from Montana, straight blonde hair, blue eyes, and pale skin. Her parents have said, we have nothing against African Americans, nothing. If there was one ounce of DNA that was within us, we would proudly say this is our heritage, but we are all European descent, every one of us. And so Ra Rachel has claimed that she is black and that being black has nothing to do with her biological makeup. Nothing at all. She says it's a matter of identifying with the history and culture of a people. And so she has divorced herself from her parents and claims that she is black because that's the way she identifies. And she believes that. She lives that way. She has taught her children that way. That's the heritage. She has told them that's what they come from and they, they learn that. And I have to say, just because she claims that as her heritage doesn't change the fact that her heritage is European. But there are plenty of people in our culture today that would affirm her fiction as reality. And we're seeing this more and more. This is similar to the denial of Jesus who came to save us from our sins and change our lives. Not just today, yes today, but not just today, but for all eternity. There are some people that deny Jesus even existed, but their denial doesn't change the fact that he did, he does, and he is the Christ. The Jesus of Epiphany wants us all to know the truth and receive it. So my questions for us tonight are, who do we say Jesus is and what is our response to him? And just like he has impacted the calendar, he wants to impact our lives. He wants to order our lives in the same fashion. He really can become the mark of our life, the turning point that gives us two eras, B.C., and AD. My prayer for all of us as the Church of Christ is that He is the mark of our lives and that we live Anno Domini. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much for revealing yourself to us. We thank you, God, for the power of your Holy Spirit to open our eyes and our spirit and our souls and our minds to truth. We thank you, God, for the courage that you give us, the bold spirit that you place within us to proclaim your glory and to live in it, to not fear anything, to not fear the unknown, Lord, for you are known to us. And in that truth, we have nothing to fear, for you are for us and never against us. And there is nothing that can stand against you victoriously. We love you so much, Jesus. We invite you to be the king of our lives. We pray in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Receive this benediction. May the God who catches our attention with stars... May that God fill you with his light.
to go into the world. And may you this week, in all of your words, actions, and all that you do, may you find yourself worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, just like the Magi did, offering all that they are. Go and offer all you are to a world that is broken for Jesus' sake. And all God's people said, amen. Go in his peace.